few weeks, we've been working our way through Peter's introduction to these exiled believers in Asia Minor. And he started off by telling them of the, the greatness of their salvation, that by the mercy of God we are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That God himself is the one who holds us fast through our faith. And that our salvation is the very thing that all the prophets have longed to, to be a part of and that even the angels long to look into. Then Peter, in verse 13 of chapter 1, started to lead them and us to see how this salvation should affect our lives. Beginning with their relationship with God, he starts there in this uh, transformation that begins to happen and how the salvation begins to affect them. And over the last three weeks, he's called us to fix our hope on Christ, specifically on His grace, knowing that uh, the... No, and, and fixing our eyes on His grace and the knowledge of His coming glorious appearance. And that hope should affect the way that we live. It should affect our holiness. We should live in holiness, being transformed through the new birth, being united with Christ in this new birth. Now, that doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we are, are perfect here and now. But it means that our attitudes and our emotions and our motivations are redeemed now. And that we seek to glorify God in our daily lives by being different from the world. Now last week we saw Peter exhort his listeners to, to carry on that next step. To go in that next step of holiness by walking in fear. Specifically a fear that they might somehow communicate to the world that the priceless sacrifice of God the Father and God the Son in purchasing their salvation was cheap. That is something that we should fear. We do believe that salvation is free. However, it is not cheap. God paid an immeasurable price to buy us back from slavery. And when we return to the foolish ways of our ignorance before we were born again, we insult the gift of God. We treat it like garbage. And we should be terrified of stealing that glory. In our text today, Peter is going to continue on. And he's going to give us two more imperatives, two more commands. And these are, are built upon the foundation that came before. He doesn't just jump right in off the bat and say, love one another. It's built on the foundation of our hope and our holiness and our fear. There's a progression that comes through. And so let's read our text together. We're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 22. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the word, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Father God, we ask for your guidance and your help as we study your word this morning, as we open up this passage and we look at Peter's exhortations to the believers that he was writing to. Uh, let it speak to our hearts, transform our hearts, grow us evermore in our love for one another and our uh, passion and desire for your word that we might grow up into our salvation. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So Peter here is, is talking about the expected results of our salvation. And the cool thing is, it, it's not like Peter is doing a commercial. Okay, this, this isn't, you know, painting the best possible outcome and then there's some fine print down at the bottom and says your results may vary. Actual results may vary. 
No, this, this is the expectation. We've already covered our hope, our holiness, and our fear. And today, Peter is giving us two more imperatives, two more expectations of the Christian life. And these aren't the results for just a, a select few super Christians out there. This is the normal, everyday grace of God given to all believers. And the expectation that all believers should walk in these ways. So look what he says in the first part of verse 22. He says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Here I think Peter is making a connection between God's making us holy, purifying us, as he just mentioned a, a few verses before, that we should be holy as God is holy, and our faith, or our obedience to the truth. Obedience to the truth, being purified by that obedience. He's talking about our salvation through faith in Christ. And he's calling faith obedience. God has called us to believe in the Son as our Lord and Savior. And therefore, our faith is obedience. It's an answering that call. It's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he calls all people to repent. And those that do, those that respond, are obedient to that call. This faith leads to a purification, a, a being made holy as God is holy. When we are saved, God washes us from our sins. He washes us from our sins. He cleanses us with the precious blood of Christ that we spoke about last week. And Christ in John chapter 15 told each of his disciples that they were already clean. They were clean because of the word that was spoken to them. And it wasn't just that they heard the word. It was that they were obedient to the word. They had obeyed it. So now Peter is saying, well, then what? <laughs> then what? This should be a familiar pattern. He's gone on in this same pattern. He said, okay, you're saved. Then what? Well, what, what comes next? We hope. Oh, well, now you have hope. What's next? Holiness, purification. And so he's following on this pattern. What should be the result of our purification? The, the message here is that the Christian life is never static. We, we're never static as believers, and we're going to get to that as we continue on today. It's a process of purification. I must tell you that there's, there's some people out there that get saved and tend to continue living their lives in the same way that they did before they accepted Christ. Just keeping on. And, and that is not obedience to the truth. You've been purified. In your obedience to the truth. At best, a salvation like that is spiritual stagnation. And at worst, it's just a, a, a fire insurance policy. A false policy to try to keep them out of hell. <coughs> the Bible teaches that true salvation is more than just mental assent without corresponding works. Or as James put it in his letter, faith without works is dead. We spoke about it two weeks ago. We said that our actions flow from our identity, and our actions prove our identity. So, Peter here is going to give us two more imperatives. And the first imperative that we're going to look at today is love. Love for believers. Peter says that one result of our salvation is love for the brotherhood of believers. And he demonstrates this in the, the preposition at the very beginning of verse 22 that says, So, a uh, little bitty word, but it tells us a lot. We should realize that loving believers is a fruit of our salvation. It is something that flows forth from our salvation. It's not something done to earn our salvation. If a person claims to be a Christian, but does not love Christians... He's not truly saved. I mean, I get that straight from John. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says, We know that we have passed out of death and into life. We have this assurance. We have our knowledge of salvation because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death, John says. John says, anyone who does not love believers has not passed from death to life. They're not truly born again. There's no life in them. Here, Jesus, uh, John was simply mirroring the teaching of his master, of Jesus, where Jesus in John chapter 13 said, By this, 
all people will know that you are my disciples. So Jesus was teaching here, this isn't about your assurance of salvation in your heart. This is about the world's knowledge of your relationship with me. He says, all the world will know that you are disciples by your love for one another. Amen. So what's the next logical response in a believer's heart to God's <clears throat> salvation after hope and holiness and fear? It's love. It's love for the church. God has called you to love the church and honor him in that. In fact, Peter clarifies that this love is the result of our salvation as he keeps going in the next verse, in verse 23. He says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. That preposition, since, right there, is meant to show us the reason why we love. We love because we have been born again. And you should see a pattern again here, right? We have been born again to a living hope. We've been born again to holiness. We've been born again to fear God. We've been born again to love one another. He saved us for this purpose. And it should identify us to the world and give us assurance in our daily lives that we truly know God if we love one another. So the, the next question that he answers comes very logically comes very logically. He says that you should love one another. Well, then the question is, how? How? And in what ways should we love one another? And I see four markers here in the text of, of our love for one another and how it's described here. Uh, look first at verse 22. In verse 22, we see, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. And I want to focus on that word brotherly first. I think that means that believers should love like family. That we are family with one another. We're part of the family of God. When he says brotherly love, he's using a Greek word uh, that is phileo. Phileo is the type of love that you give to a family member. It's brotherly love. The city of brotherly love is Philadelphia. Phileo. And remember what Christ said of his disciples when his family was trying to stop him from preaching back in Mark chapter 3 verse 33. He answered them and said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. Here, Christ is exalting the family of God over our natural, physical family. But when his family was trying to pull him away, he said, I have a responsibility to my spiritual family, to those who follow the ways of God. This is the way that Paul taught Timothy to behave within the church. How the church should relate to one another, like a family. Listen to what he said in 1 Timothy chapter 5. He says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers. Treat older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. He told Timothy to treat these older men as fathers, younger women uh, as sisters, older women as mothers. So the question is, how do you treat your physical family? If your mother was in the hospital, you would call and check in on her. If, if your younger <coughs> brother was making wrong life decisions, you would confront him about it. If, if, if you were trying to make a big decision in your life, you'd probably call your parents and ask them for their advice. You'd seek wisdom. If you get into a fight with your family, you endeavor to try to make it right. You try to do everything that you can to work it out. This is how you treat people who are part of your natural family. How much more should we treat our relationships with those that we're part of in the family of God? This is what Paul teaches that every believer should do as a result of their salvation. And so I challenge you. I challenge you to think how God is show, calling you to show familial love to the members of this church family. It's, it's an area that we all need to grow in. Number two, number two, love, not just brotherly love, but love with a sincere brotherly love. Sincerely. This word sincere that describes our brotherly love in verse 22 means literally not under a mask. Not under a mask, or not act 
acting. The, the word here in classical Greek drama, uh, Hippocrates, or hi uh, hypocrite, if you might uh, hear that. Hippocrates was an actor. He wore a face mask that projected uh, a persona, projected something to his audience, but hid his true identity under hypo, a mask, a kritis. So Hippocrates is under a mask. That's the origin of our word hypocrite. Peter here is saying that the Christian's love shouldn't be acting a part, shouldn't be wearing a mask, it shouldn't be hypocritical, but it should be an authentic expression of warm Christian affection. In a similar way, Paul exhorts believers in Rome, Romans chapter 12, verse 9, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. <coughs> believers aren't simply to play the part but are to exemplify what it means to love genuinely, completely, unhypocritically, without ulterior motives, without deceit. And we'll get there. Believer's love is to be the real thing. Uh, he reiterates this at the end of verse 22 when he says that our love should be from a pure heart. He's saying, where does this come from? How, how do we have this love? How do we communicate it? Well, it comes from the heart that has been purified by God. We have been made holy. We have been made righteous. We have been born again. And so now we act a certain way from a pure heart that has been transformed. Much love in the church is, is not from the heart. It's hypocritical. It's self-seeking. It's two-faced. We bless our pastors and glad-hand our, our folks here in church and then talk about them behind the back of home. It shouldn't be that way. It should not be that way in the church. Sincere love that we communicate here is, is not with ulterior motives. I, I heard about a, a gentleman and his wife who had kind of made the circuit to different churches. Hit one church, stayed there for about you know four to five months, six months maybe, and then moved on to the next church, moved on to the next church. And somebody finally confronted and said, what's, what's going on? You know, you, you While you're there, you're... Friendly, you're involved, you're plugged in, and come to find out that he and his wife were doing a multi-level marketing thing, and they just needed constantly more people to draw into their pyramid scheme, and so they just kept going around. That's loving with ulterior motives. Just looking to use people for your own benefit. That's not the way that, the world, that we love. That's the way the world loves. The world gives love for the purpose of receiving instead of loving simply to give. And when people have no longer served their purpose, what does the world do? It just crumples them up and throws them away. People are disposable in the world's love. They move on. It's not sincere. But the believer's love is, is sincere. It's without acting. Number three, third kind of love here. The brotherly love isn't the only type of love that's mentioned here in this verse. And it's, it's almost uh, infuriating to me that we don't have more words for love in English. We've just got the one love. We, we love mom, we love hot dogs, we love our brother, we love Jesus. It's all the same thing uh, in English. Uh, and in Greek, it's much more full. We have more words to describe it. And so here in two verses, he says you should love with a brotherly love. But then as he goes on in verse 23, he gets to the command of the passage here. The command is that we should love one another. And that love is not phileo love. It is agape love. It is sacrificial love. It is a, a love that is costly. And this is the kind of love that God has. It's an unconditional love. It's a sacrificial love. Remember, this is, this is the kind of love that is, is not tied to emotions, but is a choice. It's tied to the will. God loved us while we were still enemies of His. God loved us when we were still in rebellion, when we had done things to tarnish His glory. He loved us not because of who we are, but because of who He is in His being. God is love. And so... He loves, not because of me, but because of Him. That's agape. And, and that kind of love that forgives our sins, that separates them as far as the east is from the west, that's the command that Jesus gave to His disciples in John chapter 15. He said, this is my commandment, 
that you love one another as I have loved you, because greater love has no man than this, that one lays down his life for his friends. This is the kind of love that you would die for someone for. It's a sacrificial love. Remember what the early church did when they first were born again. You had the wealthy that came together and gathered up all that they had and sold it and gave it to the poor in the church. That they loved people and used things instead of the other way around. Using people and loving things. Amen. That's a transformation that only happens through Christ. That kind of love, that sacrificial love of the will. Jesus says it's even to be shown to our enemies, to those who persecute us. That's what it means to love with agape love. Our salvation should result not just in a familial love, but in a sincere, costly, sacrificial love. The final way that Peter describes this kind of love is with an athletic term. He uses a, an athletic term here. It's the word earnestly in the ESV. Uh, it's also translated maybe in your Bible as fervently, but fervent love for one another. <laughs> Some even have intensely, it's an intense love. Uh, in the Bible, it is always used to communicate doing something with all your might. With all your might, going all out. But in other Greek literature, it's, it's a term that is used to communicate uh, an athlete that stretches to their limit, to their breaking point. Going all the way to the limits of our, our physical abilities. Metaphorically, it just means to go all out or to reach to the furthest extent of something. That's the way our love is supposed to be. The believer's love for one another should be fervent. It should be always stretching itself. It should be pushing to its capacity. If we go with the, the exercise, physical workout analogy, I, I'm not known for my weightlifting, but I have done it in the past. And, and I know the, the way that they kind of tell you to do weightlifting is to keep lifting until you can't. Lift until your muscles say, I can't give any more reps. I can't do any more. Because once you get to that point, it's like your muscle says to your brain, Oh, I've got to get stronger next time. I've got to, I've got to grow so that I can have more stamina next time. Or so that I can lift a little bit more next time. We're, we're communicating that we need to grow. Well, it's the same thing with our love for one another. It's our same thing with our love for one another. We, we need to always be stretching our love to its capacity so that it might grow. Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, he said, carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I, I think that God will often stretch us in caring for a family member, a sister, a brother who's struggling in church. And it's hard. It is, it is indeed hard. No one says that it's easy to love one another. It is hard, often. Sometimes we want to give up under the pressure. But as we stretch to our capacity to love, God pours in more ability. He pours in greater equipping to love further and deeper. He's equipping us to love more like He loves. We grow in our love as He stretches us. I'd even say that many times, heartbreak, when, when we love someone and they turn around and backstab us, that is a doorway to even more love. The flesh responds to that heartbreak by loving less, by withdrawing. But the new heart, the, the redeemed heart, pours in more. It, it responds to that betrayal by loving even further. That, that's... God uses heartbreak and pain to deepen our reservoirs of love so that our hearts can love more easily. God's love can flow more easily through us. So maybe you've been praying in your own life uh, to be able to love God more, to be able to love your neighbor more. I think it could be possible that God is already developing in you by stretching your love for someone who's difficult, your love for a co-worker who you have trouble with, relating to, loving well, your love for a, a family member, church member that you might struggle with. God is stretching your capacity to love so that you might love more like Christ. Galatians 6, a little bit further on from what we just saw, Paul tells his readers, let's not become weary 
in doing good. Don't become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Just keep going. Keep moving forward, he says. Peter says that we should love like a family. We should love without faking. We should love sacrificially. We should love all out. Never stopping. Always growing. That's the kind of love that we should have one for another. Is that the kind of love that we have one for another? Is the question. Now somebody might look at this command and say, <laughs> Pastor, Peter, that's too much. It's too much. It's too hard. It's too difficult to do. How is it possible to love this way? How can I manage to do that? And so Peter reminds his believers here again of their new birth. He says, you've been saved by the word of God. You've been saved by the word of God. And he describes the word of God as he continues on as a seed. A seed that has been planted in them. Read in verses 23 and 25. It says, since you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory is like a flower of grass, and the grass withers and the flowers fade and fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the word that was the good news that was preached to you. Now, when you look at a seed, a lot of us have planted gardens here recently in the, in the spring and stuff, and now we're watching them wilt, right? <laughs> we're watching them wilt in the dry heat and the sun. It's being baked. Well, you look at a seed whenever you first put it in the ground, and it doesn't look like much, right? It's hardly anything. But within that seed is tremendous life. There's power in a seed. And it can grow into a, a large tree with fruits that feed many and shade your whole house. It's the same with the Word of God in our new birth. Peter mentions this to encourage believers to, to focus on the power that is within them to love. This has been planted in you. And you can see how this command to love is rooted in something we've already talked about. Hope. It's rooted in hope. We don't have a fading hope. We don't have a, a temporary hope. Like those flowers that fade and fall, or that grass that wilts and starts to crunch under your feet here in Florida. We, that, that's not our hope. As believers, we have a hope that is a living hope, a thriving hope, a growing hope. And that hope leads us evermore into love. We've been born again to a living hope through the eternal word of God. And to be able to love as Christians are commanded is simply not something that comes from man's flesh. Our flesh doesn't create that kind of love. It is something that is of God. It is born of God in us. Our own abilities are momentary. Like the flowers of the field that fade and wilt. But the glory and power of the word of God is eternal. And this is how we've been saved. And so our, our hope must be anchored in the origin of our salvation. Where does it come from? It comes from God. It doesn't come from me. If it comes from me, then it will fade and die off. It comes from the eternal word of God, Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh. Then it's eternal. And my hope is secure. That's where we rest. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. He, he continues on in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. He says, hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. As we grow up from this seed of God's planting, we become a new creation in Christ. We are new, and we bear fruit in keeping with that new identity, as we've already talked about in previous weeks. We have the Holy Spirit who's given us the power to love as God loves. And what's the primary fruit of the Spirit? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. In a believer, we have a tremendous, tremendous capacity to love. We can do it because he has first loved us. Oh, how deep, how wide, how long, oh, how vast is the love of Jesus. And that love isn't just poured out for us so that we can hold it <laughs> and, and, and put it in our little jar, but so that we can be a channel of love. 
for others, that we might love one another. And so, we're going to move on into chapter 2 here. Moving into chapter 2 as we, we come from this. So he's given us this command to love one another. But I, I want you to remember that these chapter divisions here weren't part of the original text. These were added in the 16th century by one guy, a guy named Robert Stephanus. Uh, he, he added them to help with his own study and the study of others to be able to find verses easier. And I, for one, am glad that they're there, but they're not part of the original text, okay? And so we've got to look at a paragraph and look at a train of thought that's here. Well, Peter's train of thought is still chugging along at this point. There's no break in his train of thought. As a matter of fact, he, he goes on in the very next word to say, therefore, therefore, or so. So uh, as we begin in chapter 2, uh, don't think that we're just starting something brand new here. He's not, there's not a new uh, train of thought that he's come on to. He's just continuing on in the same theme. And the next thought that I see here, the next command that he brings us to, is a threat that I see in the church to this day. It is this desire, this, this feeling of being stuck. Of just being, being spiritually stagnant. You ever felt that way? You ever, you ever thought this? You ever thought, well, this is all I'm ever going to experience of God? Now, and th those other folks over there, they've got a spiritual intensity and everything, but this is all that I've got. They might have strong desires after God. They might have deep experiences of, of, of personal pleasure in God, but I'm never going to have that. That's not me. I'm not like that. You ever been there? Stuck? spiritually stagnant. The idea behind this mindset believes that everything from our genetics to our, our family or our past experiences prevent us, keep us from changing and becoming more zealous for God, more delighted in God, more hungry for fellowship with Christ, more at home with spiritual things, more bold, more constant, more joyful, more hopeful. It says, oh, there's so many excuses that are there that keep us from that. We'll just never get there. Do you feel stuck? Being stuck takes away your hope, takes away your dreams of, of change and growth. It squashes the excitement of living. It's like saying to a, a little, little, little girl who's kind of awkward and strange. I've got, I, I work with elementary students and... I see these, these little girls, and I can tell they're getting picked on by others, and they, they haven't blossomed and bloomed like others around them. And it would be like saying to that little girl, oh, you're just always going to be this way. Sorry. That's your lot in life. That's terrible, right? That, that's terrible to say to someone physically. But it's even worse for us spiritually because the stakes are so much bigger. The stakes are so much bigger. And because we will never get to a point in our spiritual life where we've reached our final form. At least not here in this world. Not in our physical bodies. And this is, this is pandemic. It's, it's everywhere in the church. Thousands of people live year after year without very much passion for God. Zeal for His name. Joy in His presence. It's everywhere. It's apathy. It's this being stuck in just a spiritual funk. And if you haven't been there, you, you will. <laughs> it, it, it'll probably come at some point. So, what do we do then? What do we do with this feeling? Do we just say, well, that's just the way I am. I guess I'll just settle in. No. In this text, God commands us through Peter to not be content with being stuck. Don't be content with being stuck. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. He says, Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk. Long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into your salvation. This word for long here is, is a very simple word. It just means desire. Desire this pure spiritual milk. It's a command of God. For what we should desire. Now, what this means is that if you feel stuck because you don't have the kind of spiritual desires that you should, the text says you don't need to be stuck. Get those desires. Get the desires that you don't have. You don't desire the milk of the word? Well, then start desiring it. <laughs> That's the, the kind of counseling that I'm terrible at. 
Somebody comes and they're wrestling with sin. I say, well, stop. <laughs> well, then just don't do that anymore. Uh, God can command that, but it's a little harder for me to because I'm a man and he's God. This is amazing to me. This is a command of God to desire. It's a command to feel longings that we don't feel. It's a command to feel desires that we don't have. How does that work? I mean, if they're not there, if, if when the psalmist says that he pants after God, like the deer pants for the water, and we read that and go, I don't. If you read that and you think that, if you don't feel that way towards God, then are you stuck there? Or can you long for the pure spiritual milk? What do you do to obey a command like that? Peter says, long for it. Desire this. How do you produce desire? That's like telling a lame man to walk. That's like telling a blind man to see. And how can he do that? How can he command such a thing? Who could command such a thing? Who could command the lame to walk and the blind to see. Mm. There's, a, there's a short poem by John Bunyan that speaks well to this. And it, it, it is a great statement between the difference in the law and the difference in the gospel. Really short. Hear this. He says, run, John, run, the law commands. But it gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. In other words, the old covenant of God gives commands. Run! But by and large, it doesn't give the divine enablement to do it. It doesn't give the divine enablement that overcomes the deadness and depravity and rebellion of our hearts. But in the new covenant that God set up in Christ at the cross... God gives us even harder commands. Don't just run, but fly. But then he enables the thing that he commands. Run, John, run, the law commands. But it gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. This is a, a powerful deliverance from our spiritual stagnation. When you're stuck, you say, I can't fly, I can't even run. My, my feet are frozen in my genetic makeup or my family dysfunction. Besides that, I don't even have any wings. I can't fly. That's the way I am. But over against that, the gospel says, fly. The gospel says, fly. You don't have desire for the milk of the word? Well, here, have it. It creates desires in us. This idea is the very thing that turned my heart, that turned the argument for me in the argument of God's sovereignty versus free will. This is the argument that, that made the day for me. That God has the right to command of me the very thing that I can't do on my own. And the more that he commands it, the more he enables it. Augustine famously said in his confessions, he said, grant what thou commandest and command what thou wilt. Command of me what thou wilt, O God, but grant to me what you have commanded. That's the way we're supposed to pray when we believe and when we read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Long for the pure spiritual milk of the word. Long for it. Do you not have the longing? Then ask for the longing. If you don't desire the word, then seek that desire. Don't just say, well, I'm just not that way. Don't settle for being stuck. Being stuck in spiritual stagnation is not God's will for you. Amen. His will for you is growth. Amen. So, your version may say the, the milk of the word. But in the ESV, it doesn't have that. It doesn't say it. It just says, long for the pure spiritual milk. And, and so my question when I first was studying this was, what's this milk that he's talking about? <laughs> what is the milk? What is the milk? And, and I think that, uh, that the translations that have added of the word is right. It's good. It's there for explanation. Uh, but I think that the pure spiritual milk is more, it's more specific. It is specifically something in the Word. 
It is a particular idea contained in the Word. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 3 says, Like newborn infants, people who are born of the Spirit of God, long for this pure spiritual milk, just like babies do, that by it you may grow up into salvation if or since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now hear that goodness. You see the connection between the intense longing and craving for this spiritual milk and then in verse 3, the goodness of God that we have tasted. We taste the goodness of God and what does that create in us? But a desire for more goodness from God. We want more of it. We, we say, oh, that's delicious. I'll take a bowl full, right? I need more of it. And so the Milk of the word, that pure spiritual milk, is the milk of the goodness of God in the word. So both are true. We see this goodness that is there, the kindness of God. The spiritual milk is the goodness of the Lord that we experience through the word of God. It is the word of God revealing or transmitting the goodness of the Lord. You were born again by that word. That's where your salvation comes from. By the grace that is communicated in the gospel that saves you. And now, you should long for that word for the day-to-day -day experience of continuing to taste and see that the Lord is good. If the word of God is powerful enough to create you as a Christian, a new creature, don't you think it's also powerful enough to break you out of your spiritual stagnation? It can create new life in you. It can certainly overcome your genetic predisposition or your family origin or your attitude, <laughs> whatever it may be. Don't be stagnant. There's great power at work in you. It can create desires in you. It can simply can't. Right. As we come to the end here, there's a verse that we haven't quite looked at yet. We've, we've left it. It's chapter 2, verse 1. And I went to verse 2 first because that's where the imperative of the verse is. The, the imperative, the command of chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3 is long for the pure spiritual milk. That's what our command is. That our desires should be transformed and changed. But the power of the word, in the same way that it also has the capacity to create in us, to create new desires... It also has the capacity to destroy, to destroy things. So read with me in verse 1, and we see the destructive side of the Word of God. It says, so put away, or take off, or get rid of all malice, and all deceit, and hypocrisy, and evil, and all slander, and like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk. You see, one of the ways that the Word of God creates desire for the milk of God's goodness is by destroying our desire for other things. When those desires are destroyed, it makes room for us to love God and love others and to desire growth more. The Greek word here used for, for putting off uh, is, is a, a word picture. This was a common practice during ancient baptisms. In ancient baptisms early on, the, the new believers were instructed to come to the baptismal waters wearing their old tattered garments. They would say, wear your old clothes, and when you get here, we're going to give you a bright white robe to wear into the waters. And then what did they do after they finished their baptism? But take those old clothes and throw them away. They were thrown away. They were cast aside. After their baptism, they'd throw away these old clothes that would represent their old life of sin. And this is a picture that we see Paul use over and over again. My favorite is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. He said, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You've gone from death to life. You've gone from old to new. So put off the old and put on the new, he says. This call to get rid of sinful attitudes and actions fits in perfectly with his call to love. This call for us to love one another. If we're going to love our brothers, we must get rid of everything that is uncharacteristic of love. 
And he calls out these particular sins in, in particular. He says, malice we must get rid of. That's the desire to hurt someone with our words or with our deeds. Malice. Just a generic idea of, of evil wanting and desiring that against someone else. Guile. Guile is the desire to gain some advantage or to preserve some position by deceiving others. No deception in this. Tied in with that is hypocrisy, as we've already talked about. Hiding the truth. Not being known for who we truly are. Envy. Envy is the desire for some privilege or some benefit that belongs to somebody else and having a resentment that they have it and you don't. Envious hearts. And slander. Slander is this desire for revenge, desire for self-enhancement that wants to put others in a bad light so that our darkness will show less. All of these things. These are things that we must put away. We must destroy. This is the other side of longing for the pure spiritual milk. If you want to experience desire for God's word, if you want your desires to grow, if you want to taste fully the kindness of the Lord, then realize that as our satisfaction in God's goodness rises, then the controlling old man desires of malice and slander and guile and envy and hypocrisy they fade away. They die off. They are destroyed. And the reverse is also true. As you resist those things, as you lay them aside, then desire for God grows stronger and more intense in your heart. There's a twofold picture of what it means to grow and long for this pure spiritual milk. I think the point of Peter here is that these two ideas, these two things, can't flourish in the same heart. A desire for, a longing for the pure spiritual milk of the goodness of God can't exist in a heart where there is malice and guile and slander and envy and hypocrisy. They are opposites. One must go for the other to come. Cast it out. Cast it out. Fight against your spiritual stagnation from both sides. Fight to destroy those desires in you of guile and hypocrisy. And fight to taste the kindness and the goodness of God and His Word. Don't fall into that trap that says, I can't grow. I can't change. I don't need to change. Fight those things. Throw them away like a soiled garment. And instead, seek God with all of your heart for help in desiring His Word so that we might grow up together in salvation and in love with one another. Let's pray. Father God, we ask for your help. God, we, we look to you for our salvation. We look to you for our day-to-day -day sustenance. We look to you for our hope and our holiness and our fear and our love <coughs> and our growth in desire for your word. God, we are bowed before your throne, seeking these things from your hand. We want to be believers that exalt your name above all, not ourselves. We don't, we don't live for ourselves, but for God. And so God, help us. Help us to set aside the sin that so easily entangles and to run with fervor, to run with victory this race that is set before us because you have already won the race it is finished in christ we have a great hope of our final salvation in christ that we know that one day we will see you face to face and all of the the burdens and all of the sin and all of the wickedness that is surrounding us and that is in us will be completely and utterly destroyed as we walk and stand in the light of your glory. We look for that day. We look forward to that day and we long for it to come about more and more in our lives day by day by day as we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.